This video is brought to you by Magellan TV. Discover a new type of documentary film experience with Magellan TV and its binge-worthy documentaries updated every week. Got more on them in just a bit. Wherever the President of the United States goes, he travels in expensive, well-armed style. We've talked about a few of these modes of transport on this channel, as well as our sister channel mega projects, including Air Force One and The Beast, the presidential motor car. Today, we're going to talk about one that never came to fruition, the presidential helicopter. Now, the president has a fleet of helicopters that he can use regularly, but the current fleet is old, and the replacement, which we're going to talk about today, was a dramatic failure. It's called the Lockheed Martin VH-71 Kestrel, and it was a costly mistake. Marine One is the call sign of any United States Marine Corps aircraft carrying the President of the United States, usually denoting a helicopter. The first president to travel by helicopter was Dwight Eisenhower in 1957. Eisenhower was looking for a quick and convenient way to travel to his summer home in Pennsylvania, which, shocker, didn't have an airfield with a paved runway. He procured a Bell UH-13J Sioux chopper for his first flight, but instructed his staff to find a suitable long-term option. They came up with the Sikorsky UH-34 Seahorse, which became the standard for the next few years. It was replaced in 1958 with an H-13 and again in 1961 with the BH-3A. Over the decades, helicopter travel became most presidents preferred method for trips within several hundred miles as shutting down Washington DC traffic for a motorcade became more impractical. The White House's South Lawn has been used as a takeoff point ever since. New copters were added to the fleet including the VH-3D in 78, the VH-60N in 87 with all aircraft regularly updated for safety and efficiency. After the terror attacks of September the 11th, 2001, it became clear to all parties involved that the Marine One fleet needed an overhaul. The years of updates had meant increased weight without similar increases to their power, leading to a fleet of overweight, undercapable helicopters. In April 2002, the Department of Defense initiated the VXX program, which placed the Navy's Marine Corps in charge of designing and contracting the new fleet by 2011. With this new directive, work began to find replacements for the fleet of choppers that had carried the president for the last several decades. VXX, which is officially referred to as the Presidential Helicopter Replacement Program, set the goal to have the first new chopper ready by 2008. So, in late 2003, with a secretive list of requirements, the Navy issued a request for proposals for the supply of 23 helicopters. The only manufacturers to follow up on the RFP were Lockheed Martin and Sikorsky, the company that had built the previous fleet. It's unclear precisely what this RFP contained. However, congressional briefings revealed that the copter would be 20 meters, 64 feet long, and would need to carry at least 14 passengers. It would include radar jamming devices, encrypted telecommunications systems, and even electronic systems that could withstand a nuclear electromagnetic pulse. Lockheed Martin won the contract in 2005, and their new design was designated the VH-71 Kestrel. By this time, though, the project was already behind schedule. The first five aircraft were expected for delivery in 2010, but these would be much less sophisticated than the end product. In fact, they would only be used for five years after completion until the fleet of 23 was completed in 2015. However, even before the contract was awarded to Lockheed Martin, the project was already steeped in controversy. Sikorsky was in something of an authoritative position, having manufactured all of the previous presidential helicopters. More importantly, Sikorsky was able to construct every component of the chopper within the United States. On the other hand, Lockheed Martin would partner with two foreign companies, Rolls-Royce and Augusta Westland, requiring that some parts be built in the United Kingdom. Of course, given that the end product would be used to carry the president, this idea of manufacturing partly occurring overseas became controversial. Sikorsky's president took the opportunity to lambast Lockheed in the most American way possible, saying, what is a socialist country and a socialist company going to teach us about competition? The protest was enough to cause the Navy to delay their decision for almost a full year, playing a vital role in the eventual delay. The truth of the matter was that 65% of the VH-71's parts would be built in the United States, and any other components would be built by the country's closest ally, the UK. So the Lockheed Martin team was granted the $1.7 billion in funding, and work began. 
But before we hear about yet another development cycle that will go inevitably wrong, we've got a quick word from today's sponsor, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a new documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers who love history. They believe in the old adage about studying history, that you can't know where you're going until you understand where you've been. As a result, Magellan TV is one of the richest catalogues of history content available pretty much anywhere today. Everything from the Greeks to the Great War, plus modern history, biographies, scientific profiles, true crime, and so much more. Their team of producers and content developers look all over the world for new documentaries to add to their library, updating it every single week. So there's always something new. The end product is like if Netflix were designed by your favorite history professor. There are no ads on Magellan TV because there's nothing worse than your content being interrupted by an ad. So if you're looking for 4K explorations of binge-worthy topics, you should consider Magellan TV. Today I'm recommending Cold War Hot Jets. As anyone who's a regular viewer of Mega Projects and Side Projects can attest, we love pretty much anything that covers military planes in the Cold War that go really fast. So if you're looking for some different streaming options for yourself or a friend or a family member, give Magellan TV a look. Just click that link in the description below and Magellan will hook you up. And let's get back to the chopper. <laughs> While the program was delayed before it began, the delays and cost increases did not stop there. By 2007, the project cost had increased by an estimated 40%, bringing the expected total expense of the project to over $4 billion. The first prototype rolled out that year, completing a test flight in Yeovil, England, with all signs indicating that the project was going well. The helicopter was 6.5 meters tall with an 18.5 meter rotor diameter. The maximum range outstrips the requirement, coming in at 1 1,389 kilometers with a max speed of 309 kilometers an hour. However, less than a year later, the 2007 budget estimate would seem laughably small, with projected costs reaching $11.2 billion, averaging over $400 million per helicopter. Incredible. Officials from the Navy were shocked at this number. No surprises there. After all, $400 million was more than the cost of Air Force One. Finger pointing, unsurprisingly, began absolutely immediately, with the Navy claiming that the manufacturers had shown a lack of ability to meet requirements by predetermined deadlines. Lockheed responded by pointing out that the project's needs have changed entirely over the past few years. In fact, their team claims the Navy had imposed 1,900 new requirements since the project had begun. Navy officials responded by saying that they hadn't made a single additional request. A 2011 Government Accountability Office report would determine that the Navy was primarily responsible for the project's issues for three main reasons. Despite taking several years to choose a manufacturer to award the contract to, a complete review of the system's requirements wasn't made until four months after production started. Only then was it discovered that the VH-71's design could not meet the program's needs. Because of the delay, they were forced to ask for modifications after production had already started, forcing Lockheed to make substantial changes to completed aircraft. Plus, because it was the Navy, they wanted this chopper excessively equipped equipped for combat. These new requirements led to an almost entirely new helicopter, which the team began to refer to as the Increment 2, while the first iteration was the Increment 1 surprisingly. Of course, by the time this report was completed, the project was already doomed. Barack Obama's election victory in 2008 included promises to reduce unnecessary government spending, and a $12 billion helicopter fleet didn't seem to mesh well with that message. Clearly, the Marine One fleet needed an upgrade, but the massive bill just wouldn't do. By 2009, the project's total cost was already over $4 billion, with an additional $2 billion in the remaining budget. By this time, Lockheed had already completed nine VH-71s, five of which were airworthy. In search of a path forward, the Congressional Research Service presented the Obama administration with four choices. The first was to continue the VH-71 program by completing the 23 Increment 2 choppers. The additional estimate cost was $10 billion and an entry into service date of 2019. Option two was to restructure the program to provide 23 of the Increment 1 helicopters at an additional cost of $6.4 billion, which would be operational by 2012. Option three was to restructure and provide 19 Increment 1 aircraft to replace the current fleet. The additional cost for this option was estimated at $5.6 billion, with entry into service by 2012. Finally, the fourth option was to 
to upgrade and extend the current fleet at a cost of $1.4 billion. President Obama settled on option 4, upgrading the existing fleet with the remaining appropriated budget. However, it quickly became apparent that this decision wasn't quite as financially friendly as it first appeared. First of all, many of the upgraded helicopters would only last another decade or so, even with maintenance and upgrades, meaning that another new helicopter program would need to begin almost immediately. After all, within two years of Obama's decision, the oldest of the Marine One choppers would turn 50 years old. Also, the completed VH1s, which cost $4 billion to develop, were sold off to Canada for $164 million. This deal included the five airworthy helicopters, the four completed fuselages, and thousands of spare parts, all of which Canada paid for at pennies on the dollar. Despite all of the VXX program's problems, all signs indicated that the VH-71, especially the Increment 2, was a competent aircraft. With the pressing need for new helicopters, many government officials believed that the VH-71 project would eventually restart, but that was never the case. Instead of continuing what they had started, it seemed that the only option was to start over. Within a year after the VH-71 contract was cancelled, the Navy restarted the VXX program from the beginning. The first goal was to clearly define the program requirements right from the start, which the team could do relatively quickly based on their failed experience with the VH-71. The Navy asked for input from manufacturers about how to best proceed with the requirements and received feedback from a handful of companies already showing a considerable improvement over the first set of requirements, which had only garnered interest from two manufacturers. However, this time, the competitive outlook was quite different. The company Sikorsky, which had been extremely critical of Lockheed's partnerships with foreign countries, had actually been recently acquired by Lockheed. This Sikorsky-Lockheed pairing seemed most prepared to build the next Marine One fleet, and they were chosen for the contract. The decision was made to use Sikorsky's S-92 as the base aircraft for the fleet, altering the design to meet the Navy's requirements. In 2014, it was announced that the entire fleet of 21 presidential helicopters would be completed by 2023. It's unclear just how large the budget is for this project, but the first phase of the process, which would result in six helicopters, included a $1.24 billion appropriation. Seven early stage versions were completed in 2017, though they have not been integrated into the fleet just yet. Altogether, this new project's costs, combined with the sunk costs of the previous project, will likely place total expenditures somewhere in the range of 14 to 21 billion dollars. Incredible. And if you liked this video, please do smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you've got a suggestion for a future side projects video you know what to do, leave it in the comments below. Upvote the ones you like, and we might just make them. In fact, we probably will. And thank you for watching. Oh, don't forget to check out Magellan as well, today's fantastic sponsor. There's a link below.